Economic inequality is one of the most contentious issues of our time. In the United States, the poorest fifth of the population earn just 5% of the income, while the richest fifth get 2, 3, 4, no, actually 9 times as much, a whooping 46% of the total income. And so is the rather conservative estimations by the World Bank. We will see considerably higher estimations soon. Anyway, hearing numbers like those, you may ask, was it always this way? What is the reason for it? And how will inequality develop in the future? You will get the answers here at Practical Philosophy. Welcome for this video about capitalism and inequality, based on the groundbreaking book Capital in the 21st Century. The man who wrote the book is a great shining economist. He and his colleagues really did the most comprehensive data analysis that ever existed on the topics and they draw some big bold conclusions from it. His name is Thomas Piketty. Well, don't fool yourself by nice friendly faces or graphs like those which may seem dull on the first glance. This figure is super cool as it reveals the income inequality in the US over the past 100 years. And that's what I call comprehensive. More accurately, it shows the income share of the richest 10%. And look at the development. You can see the effects of the First World War, the Great Depression, the dot-com bubble and the subprime crisis in 2008. All those crises reduced inequality for some years. However, they were nothing compared to what happened here in the 1940s. Of course, that's World War II causing massive disruptions around the globe and thereby also reducing inequality quite substantially. Interestingly, inequality stayed relatively low even after the war. The reasons for that are, according to Piketty, the high inclusive growth of that period, companioned by high taxes for the very rich. This changed however in the 1980s with emerging neoliberalism. As taxes were cut back, supermanagers had higher incentives for extraordinary high salaries. Simultaneously, these social norms changed so that high salaries were more likely socially accepted. Hence, incomes are getting more and more concentrated at the top. And while this trend is most pronounced in the United States, Europe experiences a similar development. Now, let me clarify something. Inequality in itself isn't necessarily a bad thing. Some people work more, need more or invest more in education. So paying everyone the same would probably be a bad idea. However, what PKT discovered is that the recent rise at the top has nothing to do with better education or increased effort. In fact, there's no sign that supermanagers got more productive in any way. Moreover, consider that this is very much a zero-sum game. If the top management gets more from the cake of the total income, then the workers at the bottom will get less. Indeed, the richest 10% US Americans are absorbing three quarters of the annual growth. Thus, while the economy grows with 2%, most people, in fact 90%, will see their income rise only by 0.5%. And that is just the average, meaning that the poorest half of the population may not see any rise in incomes at all. Ooh, this actually explains a phenomenon which is very present in the US but also in Europe, stagnant wages despite economic prosperity. But please don't be shocked too much yet because it will get much worse. After all, the book is called Capital in the 21st Century and not Income in the 21st Century. By the way, Capital for Piketty is the same as wealth, basically anything that is worth money. Shares, bonds, real estate, financial assets and so on. You see how capital developed in the last century in Europe. The craziest time was before World War I as aristocrats and industrials owned seven times worth the national income slash GDP. This changed dramatically with the destruction caused by the two world wars. However, capital began rising soon after and it seems only a question of time when we reach the levels of the early 20th century. 
Okay, you may say, what is the big deal? Capital is actually a nice thing, isn't it? More capital means more factories, bigger companies and larger houses. Aren't those good things? Well, it can become problematic if the distribution is very unequal. And bad surprise, inequality of wealth is just crazy. 99% of the world's population own 50% of the global wealth. This means that 1% of the global population own half the world. This is 50 times more than they would own if everyone was equal. Now you may be shocked, but I guess you are also excited to hear the reasons. Here is the short version. First, very obviously, income inequality causes wealth inequality. So rising wages for super managers explain part of the riddle. Second, be aware of R bigger than G. Of course, Piketty is an economist and so he honors his profession with the formula. It means that the rate of return on capital is bigger than the growth rate. And actually this holds true since thousands of years. If you got some capital, it grew on average 4 to 5% every year. The growth rate, on the other hand, was very low for most of human history and only reached 4% in the mid of the last century. Ok, ok, but slow. Why is it a problem if the growth rate is lower than the rate of return on capital? Well, the wages of the average worker only grow as the economy grows. Capital, however, grows with the average return rate of the 4 to 5%. This means that income from capital grows faster than income from labor. Hence, capital owners are fundamentally in a better position and will surpass labor workers. Additionally, and that is the third reason, it gets much easier to save money if you have more. Saving even a fraction of your income is impossible if you need all of it to survive. The return on capital, however, comes on top of what you already earn. So it's much easier to save and reinvest part of it. However, size matters a lot. Let me explain with an example. Assume that John, this worker here, actually managed to save some money, say $50,000. As he has no understanding of the stock market or alternative investment, he just goes to a bank and gets 2% return every year. Compare that to the aristocrat Ellie. Her ancestors have already worn expensive plate armor and they inherited some wealth to her. Hence, she has a quite big fortune of $1 billion, which she wants to invest wisely. So she spends $3 million on an advisor who manages her investments and acquires some of those alternative investments that no one understands. At first it may seem crazy to spend that much on a financial advisor. However, it will pay back in her rate of return which goes up to 8% per year. That is 4 times as much as John and means that she will get 80 million dollars annually. Then she can party away 40 million dollars and reinvest the other half. With that her wealth will double in just 18 years to 2 billion dollars. And at this point she may hire a second advisor who may raise her rate of return even further so that it only takes 14 years to double her wealth again approaching the 4 billion. Long story short, the richer you are, the easier it gets to acquire more and more wealth. On the flip side, it is hard to become rich if you aren't already. In France, two thirds of the wealth is inherited. This means that the most prominent way to get rich is to have rich parents. To stop or at least decelerate this dynamic, taxes play a key role. Remember this not quite golden age here? During those times, super rich people had to pay 80% taxes on their income. And that was not in some socialist countries, but in the United States indeed. 
Unbelievable, isn't it? However, it was a very elegant way to increase revenue during wartime without letting people starve to death. And its effects were substantial. For the first time in history, the real rate of return fell below the growth rate. By the way, real means after taxes and the destructions by the two world wars. How wonderful, but ooh, look at the prognosis. Piketty expects this to change again in the 21st century as both growth and taxes are declining. Indeed, taxes are becoming regressive instead of progressive already today. While taxes on wage labor are still mildly progressive, consumption and capital incomes are subjects to a flat tax. And since the flat tax on capital income is mostly lower than the top tax on labor income, capital owners are paying less. So even without considering any form of tax avoidance, wealthy people have an easy time again. That is where I see Piketty's biggest contribution. He identified systematic forces of divergence that are inherent to capitalism. And those forces like R bigger than G, higher saving rates and larger rates of return for rich people may lead to extraordinary high levels of inequality unless, well, unless we could pull off something crazy like a global tax on wealth. To use Piketty's own words. The history of income distribution has always been political. That is my attempt to end with a positive note. Thanks for bearing with me for this long video, which was nevertheless far too short to cover the whole beauty of Piketty's arguments. So please grab a copy and dive into it. And regardless whether you have additional insights from the book, another source, or if you just want to discuss a question, please share your thoughts in the comment section below. Thanks for watching and see you again at Practical Philosophy. Have a good day and goodbye.